Okay, Doc. So um, I just wanted to um, remind everybody, if you haven't already, if you could email me your mailing address um, for your uh, textbook so I can send you a paper copy of the textbook. So if you could just send that to j at bluerockstation.com. Um, just send me the address where you would like this book mailed to if you haven't done so already, and I'll get those out to you right away. You should have a PDF version of the textbook available to you at this point. If you haven't, let me know. I'll, I'll make sure you have that link to download the PDF textbook. And I think everybody's, uh, when I've looked, everybody's been able to get into uh, the system. A couple of you have had little little bits of trouble with some of the audio where sometimes it stops playing. To my knowledge, Chrome seems to be the uh, the the uh, um, bad uh, player in this. So if you're trying to use Chrome as your browser, try a different one. Try Edge or, or Mozilla or something. It tends to take care of that. Uh, if you have to use Chrome, you can back up and move forward on the slides, and then the audio will start playing. That's annoying. Um, but but it is a solution. And um, and I think maybe the Mac iPad might have an issue there. Some people have had issues where they couldn't get the video to play or the audio to play, but that seemed to be their own internet connection, nothing to do with the system. So sometimes if you've got a really unstable internet connection, it just sort of pairs those things off. So once you get to a place where you've got good connection, um, it'll work just fine. So that was, um, those were a couple of the announcements. Does anybody have anything they want to bring up, things they ran into um, this week as you were going through the program? Any issues like that? Give you guys an opportunity to scream, to yell out any frustrations. So, okay. Well, let me, um, let me touch base. At this point, we should really be, Chapter four, chapter five, that's kind of where you should be in the program at this point. Chapter four is is pretty much a um, uh, electrical review. I'm going to go to the share screen. Gosh, I've got to remember how to use. How come I don't have an easy share screen? Oh, I see. I'm looking at the wrong thing. All right. So if I jump into sharing the screen, um, okay, at this point, can you guys see like I should be in the um, in the program, the residential program? We're good. All right, so if you look at chapter four over here, um, what is basic electricity? Um, some of that hopefully is review for some of you. It doesn't have to be. You can be brand new to um, to electrical concepts and still do fine in this program. But but there is a certain basic electrical knowledge that needs to be uh, absorbed. Otherwise, you're going to just be confused. Like what is a watt? What is an amp? What is a volt? What is resistance? Um, what is Ohm's law? Uh, Ohm's law is just basically saying there is a relationship between resistance and um, amps or resistance and amps and volts. Yeah, ver. Um, the the equations that you're going to need for this exam there aren't very many, but um, you pretty much touched on most of them at this point. Three equations you're just going to have to remember. You're going to have to remember the power equation, which is watts equals amps times volts. That's pretty straightforward. A watt is amps times volts. So if you have a um, 120 volt system and you're using two amps, then you're going to be con consuming 240 watts. You know, if you're using half an amp, you're going to be consuming 60 watts. So that's just the relationship that goes on there. You're going to have to know Ohm's law, which I always just remember is ver volts equals amps times resistance. So uh, that again is a simple relationship. If you know two of them, you can figure out the third one. 
Uh, and then this chapter, we get into the third equation, which is a subtle variation on Ohm's law, which is the voltage drop equation. And what that's saying is voltage drop equals amps. And in this case, amps is typically going to be whatever the amp output of your solar array is times resistance. The resistance is something you look up in the table. Um, in fact, if I, well, in the, in the table where, um, where the, uh, uh, NEC will, will tell you what the resistance is of various, um, uh, wires based on their wire size and their composition. So, oh, Firefox can't open that page. That's not good. Let's see what's going on here. All right. I guess it was having a momentary blip. So, so again, you're you're getting the resistance, but the resistance that comes from the NEC is in ohms per one thousand feet. So you've got to adjust that for how how many feet are you using, right? So you're looking at the cable run, and and it's um, the amount of cable that's involved in that circuit is going to be twice the distance between these two points. The reason it's twice the distance is it's a circuit. So the wire goes there and the wire comes back. So the electron is actually traveling over twice the distance. So all our, the voltage drop equation is voltage drop equals amps times resistance times twice the distance divided by a thousand feet. So you're simply saying, what proportion of a thousand feet am I going? Because that's the number I got from the book per 1,000 feet from the NEC. So it is Ohm's law, but it's adjusted for distance. So that's how you're figuring out your voltage drop. <clears throat> so I, I thought what we could do is just sort of walk through the quiz here um, in, in um, the book or in the system. And it's uh, basically the question it's saying is, for the purpose of this, a cable run is connected to a single string of six 290-watt solar panels. Each of them has a VMP rating of 31.8 volts and an IMP rating of 9.19 amps. Now, you should be able to just sort of verify this by saying if watts equals amps times volts, um, 31.8 times 9.19 should end up equaling right around 290. So that's where they get these numbers from. All right. Now, in this particular case, we don't really care what the volts are. We're, we're talking about voltage drop, which is a, a factor of amps here. So it says the cable run is 290 feet. So that's what you've been given here so far. So now what are you going to do? How are you going to figure out what the voltage drop is of this particular run? Well, as I said, the voltage drop equation is, is voltage drop equals amps. Well, in this case, the amps are going to be 9.19. Because when you have one string, if I hook them up in a string, voltage increases, but amps remain the same. So it doesn't really matter how many panels are in the string, the amperage rating of that string is going to be the amperage rating of a single panel. Because when hooked up in series, which is the definition of a string, voltage is going to keep going up for every panel you add, but amps is going to remain the same. So my amperage is going to be 9.19 amps times twice the distance, so 290 feet, divided by 1,000 feet. So in this case, it's going to be twice 290, which is, uh, if my math is right, 580, divided by 1,000. So that's going to be 0.58. So the voltage drop equation is going to be 9.19 times the resistance. Well, what is the resistance? It's saying that this is using somewhere, it should tell me what the cable is. Cable runs 290. Oh, practice for a given wire. So I guess it's going to ask us, all right, what's the resistance of a 12-gauge wire? Stranded copper. Well, right here, it's it shows stranded copper in this column, and it shows 12-gauge there. 
So the resistance for stranded copper is 1.98 ohms per 1,000 feet. So that would be the correct answer there. Let's just double check, make sure I'm right. All right, we're right. So then we go on to the next one. And it says, using the voltage drop equation, determine the voltage drop to two decimal places um, in this example, if we use 12 gauge wire. So at this point, we would say 9.19 amps times 1.98, which is resistance, times twice the distance divided by 1,000. So that's going to be 0.58. So if I plug that into my calculator, hopefully I will see that it's 9.19 times uh, 12 gauge is 1.98 times 0.58. And I'm getting 31.37. So let's see if that's going to be, is that one of the answers? What am I doing here? Uh, I've got you guys' picture down here at the bottom. Am I missing? I got to move, move this because I don't see any of the answers there. All right, I don't know why the answers didn't show up on my screen or the options. So it's showing 12. So what did I, oh, 0.98 times 1.98. Oh, I put divided by 0.5 instead of times 0.5. All right. Okay, so it's showing then that 9.19 times 1.98 times 0.58, I should have got a 10.55 voltage drop. Is that what everybody hopefully saw? And for whatever reason, it didn't give me an option there to see for my answers on this screen. All right, so then uh, it says, is this acceptable if we want to keep it below um, 2%, which is kind of always the goal. We want, we're never going to get zero voltage drop, but you want to keep it below 2% um, for your entire system. So when you're designing a solar system, it's usually the connection between the solar array and the, the DC disconnect at the, uh, at the inverter that's going to be the longest run. That's going to be the majority of voltage drop. But there's still going to be voltage drop for all those little sections. You know, there's voltage drop even for the string as the panels are connected. So if you really want to get technical, although most people ignore it, you'd have to figure out what's the voltage drop at, between panels. Because in a big solar array, it might be 30 or 40 feet from one end of the array to the other. So you might have to calculate that. Um, in fact, in end phase systems, uh, they now, they, they generate at AC, but we're starting to see where the connection of the string is in the center of the string, not at either end, just to minimize voltage drop so that it feeds from the middle, not from the end, so that you've cut the voltage drop in half because from either end, it's only half the distance that the electricity has to, has to travel. So that's an issue there. Um, so what is our percentage? Well, we now know we're losing a little bit over 10 volts. What is the voltage of this particular system? Well, in this case, if it's a typical 600 volt system, um, it's saying a voltage drop 10.55, is 1.76, which is below 2%. All the others say the loss, even though the loss is 1.76 when added to the other systems, uh, circuits in the system, the voltage drop of the complete system will likely exceed 2%. Well, that's logical, although we don't know that for sure. No, this is a single phase residential. So the output of the inverter will be 240. Well, 
that doesn't matter because we're measuring the DC uh, portion of that. So that's sort of a misleading thing. Uh, no, the voltage of the circuit is 190 volts, 190.8. When you combine the panels with a 10 volt, a 10 volt DC, so that we're at 5.53. Well, let's see if it's right. It does say that the voltage is 31.8 volts. And remember, it's in series. So every time you connect this together, the voltage goes up. It's saying there's a string of six. So six times 31.8 is going to give us 190.8 volts. And we're losing 10.55. So our losses are 5.53. So the correct answer here is going to be that last one. We're actually losing 5.53% from this circuit. Um, how do we minimize that? Well, one way is to try and make your strings as high a voltage as possible. See, in this case, you can see if it were at 600 volts, we'd only be losing 2%. Voltage drop remains the same. But we're not. We only have six panels. If we had um, 18 or 19 panels, we'd be up closer to 600 volts and, and we'd have less voltage drop as a percentage. Um, this is one of the issues that we get into where uh, in Europe, the minimum voltage is like 1,000 volts. Uh, so their systems actually suffer less voltage drop. Uh, it is not more dangerous to have that higher voltage. Um, some people think it is, but it's it's really not. So um, so really, higher the voltage, the the less loss there is. The system can be cheaper, significantly cheaper. So every time the NEC comes out, we keep thinking it's going to increase the voltage limitation from 600 volts. But I've been saying that through the last three or four cycles. And it hasn't. So uh, I think what happens is the manufacturers get involved in that and they have embedded product and they say, we don't want to have to retool our factories. Let's try and keep this thing the same. Um, so the answer is D here. Uh, what are what are some of the other issues or some of the other ways you can reduce voltage drop? I mentioned you can increase the voltage of the system. Anybody have any insight? How else can we do that? Don't be shy. Otherwise, I'll start picking on names, right? I'll say, Clark, I can see you. Any any answer there, Clark? How do we reduce voltage drop in our system? You're going to have to unmute, but. Well, I'm trying to look at one of the components of that formula. Um, I guess distance, if you could shorten the distance, uh, yep. it would play a part of that. Yep. Yeah, you're following exactly the right. Um, process. Shorter distance, less voltage drop, for sure. Higher voltage, less voltage drop, for sure. Um, now, hopefully you've designed your system to minimize distance regardless, because otherwise, the longer the distance, the more expensive it's going to be, you know, all of that kind of thing. Um, typically, the first thing you're going to do is just increase the wire size. Uh, that's, that's, your, that's your first step, because notice the bigger the wire, the smaller the resistance, the less resistance. Um, so in this instance, if we went from 12 gauge and we went to 10 gauge or eight gauge wire, then our resistance is gonna be significantly different. Um, um, let me move that out of the way. So um, for example, it's 1.98 with um, 12 gauge, so if we if we say with 10 gauge, just go into 10 gauge, well, we know that our voltage is 190. Um, sorry, I don't need that yet. Uh, so so the um, amperage remains the same. So we're still talking about 9.19 times, and instead of 1.98, it's going to be 1.24 times 0.58. So we've got 6.6 .6 volts of loss by going with the bigger wire. So we take 6.6 .6 divided by, uh, in this case, 190.8, 
and now we're at 3%, 3.5%. Well, that still exceeds 2%. So what would we do? Well, let's go to 8-gauge cable. And so 8-gauge cable would be, in this case, 9.19 um, is the amps times a resistance of 0 0.778 times the distance issue, which is 0.58. Now it's 4.15. So 4.15 divided by the voltage of the system, which is 190.8. And now we're to 2%. So if I wanted this to be 2%, I would have to go to eight, eight gauge cable. All right, why wouldn't I just always use eight gauge cable or larger cable? Well, in that case, it's simply a matter of cost. Um, you know, sometimes putting in bigger wire, it can be difficult, um, you know, just cumbersome, pulling the wire through the conduit, making your connections. Smaller might be better, um, but in this case, it's going to cost you more money to go with eight gauge wire, but you got to do it. Typically that's going to be your solution. Go with eight gauge or even six gauge wire. Uh, the difference in cost as you get up there is becoming more dramatic. Uh, 12 gauge wire might cost you, I don't know, 70 cents a foot. Uh, whereas uh, six gauge, four gauge wire might be a buck 50 a foot. You know, so doubling the cost. If you're going with hundreds and hundreds of feet, that's hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So that's that's an issue. Um, oftentimes you're going to um, put in bigger wire if you think you're going to be expanding the system in the future. So that's one of the future proofing things is let's say that you're putting in 20 panels now, but you might extend it to 40 panels in the future. Put in wire today that will accommodate 40 panels. You know, it's a lot cheaper to put it in when you're first installing it than it is to try and pull out everything and retrofit it at a future date. The risk you run is you're never gonna expand the system, but okay, so you spent a few hundred bucks you didn't need to spend, but it's better than spending a few thousand dollars later to, to expand the system. All right, so it says, what will be the voltage drop if you do number eight? And we we figured that out. I think it was 4.15 if memory serves, which is going to be just a hair over um, 2%. Uh, what's the voltage drop there? It's 2.17%. Is that acceptable? Well, now you're kind of in the mode of probably it is. We want to try and keep within 2%, but you may not want to be crazy about it. Um, voltage drop is not a safety issue necessarily. It's a performance and an economic issue. Um, you know, if you're if you're generating a hundred watts and you're losing ten percent of it, you just lost ten percent of your investment. You know, you you paid for a hundred watts, but you're only getting ninety. So if the system cost you 10,000 bucks, but you're only getting 90% of it, you just wasted $1,000. So does the bigger wire cost more than 1,000 bucks? You know, that's kind of the economic play you have to put into place. Is the money I'm losing more or less than the cost of me adding bigger wire? So that's a, that's a balance that you've got to sort of try and strike. So we finished, I think, I think we missed one because I couldn't find the right answer there. So we got 80%. Well, surprise, surprise. Now we get to um, move forward. All right. Anybody have any questions from chapter four at all? Um, in your review packets, you have uh, access to the quiz, a video that we've done for the quiz. So, um, you know, feel free to, to wander through that. I don't want to go through the quizzes necessarily here. All right, give you guys a shot. Okay, then um, I'm going to jump down here into chapter five. Chapter five is when we sort of get into um, some of the meat of the of the class. 
Um, we're starting to look at the various components and beginning to um, understand why we would select one over another. So that's kind of, you know, why, what these things do, what are the advantages, disadvantages of one system versus another. So hopefully you're beginning to come away with some of that knowledge as you go through this. Um, in this one, in the quiz, parts of the combiner box, this is a, um, this diagram is a typical standalone um, combiner box. This is one like we'll work on during the labs. And so it's just asking you to identify what are some of the bits. Um, so if we look at A, A is, is the ground rod. That's the symbol that's going to be telling you that that is going to be the ground rod. So you're going to just dump that down into there. What is B? Well, B, this, from looking at that combiner box, this is a surge protector. So that's um, an add-on. They're not necessarily part of it, but um, it's a good idea to put a surge protector into the system. And at the combiner box is a good place to do so. And then C, well, C is the overall combiner box. And of course, by the time you get there, you've only got one choice left. So this one is just dumping it there. And, and it's going to ask you, yes, we are correct. So then it's saying um, sort identify. So D, D is uh, right here. That you can tell by the green is your grounding bus bar. That's where all of your grounds get connected. And then everything gets connected into a ground rod. This is clearly a, 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 a ground-based system. If it were on the roof, you may not need that ground rod coming from that system. It's going to go, and this this one just shows it's going on to the next piece of equipment. Um, e up here, that looks like a fuse. That's the symbol for a fuse there. So it could be a breaker coming in, but the choice here is fuses. And then F is uh, the solar panels. Yeah. And then we'll check that. And we better be right. So on and so forth. And then the G, well, G in this case, we've got a black wire and a red wire. What is the wiring um, convention? Well, in this case, G is going to be, this is the output and these are the inputs from the solar panel. So uh, this is going to be the PV source circuit, PV output to the DC disconnect, or sorry, the source circuit comes into the combiner box. From here, it's the PV output to the DC disconnect. That's the next place um, that we have. Uh, then uh, H, H is, in this case, looks like a um, the positive connection point here. So that's the positive string connector. And then this is going to be the negative because it's black. And those are all the bits on that. Were there any questions on the um, combiner box per se? Give you guys that option. Uh, it, pretty straightforward there. Just, um, oh, I wanted to show you, um, let's see, I think I've got to stop the sharing. I wanted to show what is typically going to be a, um, a more common combiner box now. All right, oops, no, nope, that's okay. Let me see if I can. Okay, so this is typically more common uh, for the combiner box. And this is an end phase combiner box. So it looks like this when you come in. End phase is an AC output system, microinverters. 
So inside this combiner box, there are places for four branch circuits coming in. I'm not, so I'm not seeing your screen, Jay. I'm seeing your desktop. Oh, okay. Just the desktop and not the not the picture. All right. Well, let me see. Sorry. Um, oh, that's good. Let me know when. Is that is that better? Yep. Thanks. Oh, okay. Good. So so this is the combiner box here. And um, you'll notice four breakers where the four different uh, PV systems, uh, four basic branch circuits from the, which would be strings if it were a DC system, come in and can be terminated. Notice these have lockdown breakers. So um, they, they have a little hole in the breaker with a screw that screws in and it keeps you from removing the breaker when it could be energized. They don't want you pulling these things out when there could be power present. So it's just an added safety step there. And, and typically they're beginning to require these in a lot of places. Um, now it doesn't show all of it. I'll see here. This is what the, the system looks like from the outside uh, be, when before you remove that little plastic panel. So this is your end phase combiner box. And up in the right-hand corner is all of the communication system. Uh, that's how the system uh, connects to your Wi-Fi. And then it also connects to the, to the cloud. And so you can use um, hand, you know, your, your phone and the like to monitor your solar array. Um, this box down in the bottom left-hand corner is a uh, cellular modem and a communication device. So the cellular modem is there in case the power goes out to your Wi-Fi modem, if that's how you're connecting in. So it's kind of a redundant communication system. And then it also has a Bluetooth device in it so that this system can communicate with the batteries and with the disconnect switch. So it's an AC coupled system. So each of these electronic components anymore has a Bluetooth communication device built into it. And so the, con the combiner box is now the sort of brains of the operation and it's communicating with all of those through that. And, uh, and then there are also uh, what are referred to as uh, CTs. These are, um, um, gosh, just went out my brain, but they're um, transformers, uh, little tiny um, transformer devices that measure power output and they also measure load consumption. So inside the combiner box, you're going to feed your line one of your branch circuits through this little, um, like an amp meter almost, you know, like one of those ring closing amp meters. And it's going to measure the amperage that comes through that. Um, and so that's going to tell you what the production is from your solar array. Then there's also a connection that goes to your main disconnect switch in your, in your solar panel. And it runs CTs over to that. And you clamp those around the two lines coming from your utility. So it's basically you clamp those on between the, the meter and your main disconnect in your service panel. There's usually two wires that are exposed up above that and you can just clamp around those. What that's doing is measuring how much power you're using in the house from the utility. So this gets pretty complicated because what it's trying to do is saying, okay, you're generating this much power from your array. You're using this much power from your utility. Every time I feed power from the array to the grid, to your loads, you're reducing the power from the utility. How much are you exporting back to the utility? So it's measuring all of these things so that you can then begin to not only see what you're doing, but then you can program in the switch okay, I've got batteries and I've got time of use pricing. So I want to modify how and when I charge my batteries. Do I use only the power from my solar array or do I use power from the grid to charge my batteries, but only when it's cheap? You know, so there's a lot of programming that can go into these systems based on what your utility is charging you. 
Um, but you've got to have the data first. You've got to be able to measure what you're what you're producing and what you're using. So that's what those CTs are there for. And that's all built into this combiner box. So this is a unit that probably if you get out there into the world doing systems, this is something you're going to end up using. And on our on our Solar Noon Tuesday um, uh, meetings that I was late because of that, I post all of those videos to the website uh, under the same tab that you guys access this course. You'll notice there's a drop down menu and it'll say Solar Noon Tuesday. Click in there and there's a whole bunch of technical videos from those meetings. And we get into detail about these systems, other, other issues that are out there in solar. So if you want to uh, do a little more study, um, those, those videos are available to you. And since I'm in here, I'll just show you, this is obviously microinverter. Um, this is the latest version of the IQ uh, system from Enphase, the IQ8s. And the difference that uh, for these is they now will work when the grid goes down without batteries. So this will essentially take power from the array when it's available and use it for your loads, even when the grid is down and without battery backup. So that's a new innovation. But obviously, because it's using power from the array, you need to have something, uh, the smart switch, built into the system that will um, first off trick the array into thinking that the grid is still operating. And secondly, um, disconnect from the grid. So that's what this unit is doing. So we're kind of getting into an AC coupled system and now it's starting to look pretty complicated. But this is the smart switch from end phase and that smart switch is designed to, uh, you can see on the right-hand side, the red and the black wire feeding in under that sort of grayish box on the right-hand side. That's coming from the main uh, or from the utility into this box. And then the similar wires that are leaving on the left-hand side, that's going to your critical load panel. So this is what this switch does. It's basically connecting your main panel to your critical load panel. And when the grid is operating, it just simply is a pass-through. It's like a bus bar almost. You're connecting the two together. But as soon as the grid goes down, this smart switch recognizes it, it senses it, and it disconnects you from your main panel and then redirects all the power from the array and any power from batteries only to the critical load panel. So that's that's kind of at its most basic what this box is doing. Um, it's it's basically an auto transformer or an auto disconnect, or as they will call it, their smart switch. So that's another piece of equipment you'd have to put into the system if you're doing an AC coupled system. And bear in mind, this little unit here weighs about 80 pounds. So it it does take a couple of people to uh, mount that up on the up on the wall. So just to give you a little sense of what some of the equipment actually looks like. All right, so uh, let me go back into share again, and I'll jump back into here. Um, the other thing I think the last thing I'll do here today is look at the ampacity using the ampacity table, because this is something you're going to be doing a, a lot, figuring out the ampacity of wiring systems and what size wire you need. So the NEC has gone ahead and set up specifications for what is the maximum ampacity that any particular size wire can handle. Well, you notice different types of wire have different types of uh, different limits of ampacity. So at the lower temperature wire, uh, this isn't the temperature of the wire. This is the temperature that the wire is rated for. So the outside temperature, we don't know what that is, but this is the impacity rating of that wire. So TW and UF, UF is underground feeder. You'd see that a 12 gauge wire has 25 amps. If you get into the mid temperature wires, THHN, THWN, those kind, those are pretty common. 
wires that you're going to find down at Lowe's, you know, if you go down there, that one again is 25 amps. But then if you get into PV wire or uh, THH or uh, N or, or use two, um, that has a higher ampacity rating, 30 amps in this case for 12 gauge. Now, I know I make this point in the course, but you don't always know what these wires are going to be connected to. So even though the wire in this case might have, let's say 10 gauge wire has a 40 amp rating, I might be connecting it to a terminal in a disconnect or a terminal in an inverter that is only rated for 60 degrees Celsius. So the, the ampacity rating of the entire circuit is limited by the weakest link in that circuit. So if since I don't know what it's connecting to, I should assume the ampacity in column one. I should assume the worst case scenario. That's just good design practice. You can get away with assuming like column three, if you have already specified all of the equipment that's going to be in the system, but then that also assumes that equipment never gets changed out. So not really good practices. So I'm going to tell you, these are the ampacity ratings based on the wire, but always try and use column one when you're selecting the ampacity rating for the wire, because that's going to keep you safe in all situations. Does anybody have a question about that? Good. All right. So if I start the quiz here, it's saying, okay, using the chart, if we have used two, so that's in the third column, conductor, it's 12 gauge, and each connector at each end is rated for 90 degrees Celsius. What is its ampacity? Well, it's 12 gauge. It's in the third column. We go over and it's going to be 30 amps. Okay, so that's straightforward. Although, once again, I would say in your design, you should figure it on 25 amps. Using the chart above, um, what if the ends are unknown? Well, that's going to be 25 amps, right? Because I don't know what's at each end. So let's use column one. It's pretty straightforward there. And that's really where you should be going. All right, the conductor is a used two, 12 gauge, in conduit, exposed to sun and resting directly on the roof. The termination ratings are unknown. The highest ambient end temperature is 40 degrees. What is the amp rating adjusted for temperature? Well, this is a little bit of an old diagram, but we would go in here and we would say, all right, it's gonna be 40 degrees. So it's going to be 82%. So 82% of 25 amps is, what's that? 25 times 0.82. Let's see if I'm doing this right. 20 and a half. So it's going to be somewhere in here. I'm getting, oh, it's taking it from that. It's taking it from uh, 0.91. Oh, 12 and a half amps. How did I screw that up? 12 gauge, used to. Well, we already knew 12 gauge was 25 amps. Oh, I I, I remember. Yeah. Um, we've also got to make that temperature adjustment because it's lying on, on the deck. So let me make a note of this because some of the some of this has changed. Because it's lying on the deck, they're saying you've got to do a 0.5 adjustment. Um, you know, it can only carry half of it, but the NEC has changed on this. So let me go in and change this. And for, it. for some reason, they added 30 degrees of that 40 degrees. That's how you got your 50.5. Yeah. I, I, I didn't quite catch that, but. Yeah, what that is, is in the old NEC before this latest edition, um, what they did is if 
if the wire is in conduit exposed to sunlight and touching the roof, you have to add 30 degrees to the ambient air temperature, the highest ambient air temperature. And there was a different diagram um, that that did that adjustment. Oh, in this case, yeah, in, I'm showing over here. So you're getting 70 uh, degrees Celsius, not Fahrenheit again. So um, yeah, so it's 0.58. Is that right yeah. here? I think it was point 33, de 33 degrees Celsius added to it. What's it? I think I'm watching it 71, 75. That's where you got your 50. Okay. 40, 40 plus 33 means 73. And in that range, it took you over to 0.5. Yeah. Let half, me... half of 25 amps. Or, yeah. That's yeah. Half. half of 25 amps. That's, yeah. So that's where that came from. And that used to be the case. I'm making a note to go in and change this particular question because the, um, the code has changed. Um, on that, and it's a little bit simpler. There's no longer another table there, um, so so I'll make that modification. But if if this was not touching the roof and not exposed to sunlight, then we really wouldn't have to make a temperature adjustment. Um, and the way they used to make the temperature adjustment was adding, in, in this case, it was like, if it's touching the roof, it's this much. If it's a half inch off the roof, it's this much. If it's three inches off the roof, it's another different temperature adjustment. And, and it was pretty complicated. And then they found that anything less than an inch causes a problem. Anything more than an inch didn't cause a problem. So they changed it and said, okay, if it's less than an inch, add this. And if it's more than an inch, ignore it. Um, so often now the uh, wiring and conduit manufacturers and the racking manufacturers will give you little um, flashed offsets. So if you've got to run it in conduit and it's exposed to sunlight, they've got little flashing units that actually raise the conduit more than an inch off the roof and, and run it that way. But mostly we avoid this by... Um, running it underneath the solar panels so it's not exposed to sunlight uh, just attaching the wire to the um, to the railing or the racking and then penetrating through the roof underneath the solar array so that nothing is ever exposed to sunlight but you'll have situations where it's exposed to sunlight there's just no getting around that so you do have to realize, and really, I guess the main takeaway is heat affects the impacity rating of these systems. That's really where you're coming to. And then there's another one about, um, oh, here. Okay, uh, the ISC of the panel is 8.36 amps. What's the minimum impacity rating for the cable for each string? Uh, from this array with no temperature derating. Um, so the amps, in this case, 8.36. And this is the, um, so I think what this is getting at, I should have looked through these before I got here, but I think what this is getting at is for the NEC, there's the safety margin of 1.25. And then because it's solar, there's another additional safety margin because of the variability of solar. Um, you know, everything is based on 1000 watts per square meter of energy hitting the solar array. But I've had measurements when I've taken um, samples where it's 1200 watts per square meter. So, so that's going to generate more amperage. It's going to generate more power than standard test conditions. So to uh, adjust for that, they just say, let's throw another safety factor in there. So in this case, I would take 8.36 times 1.25 times 1.25, and I'm going to guess without doing the calculation, it's somewhere around 13. It's pretty pretty common. Yep. So that's the that's the adjustment. So I need to have 13 amps. Well, which wire am I going to use? In theory, 14 gauge, but never use 14 gauge wire. Just never do. 12 gauge is the absolute minimum, but I always recommend 
in your mind, make 10 gauge wire your minimum wire size. The difference in cost between 12 and 10 is marginal, and uh, it's gonna save you a lot of headaches if you just simply tell yourself, 10 gauge wire is the minimum wire I'm gonna use. That's gonna, I mean, that saved my bacon on a lot of different installs because you might forget to do the temperature adjustment or whatever. Well, that's gonna be now not an issue because you use bigger wire. Um, panels with an ISC of 9.37 are incorporated into the array. There are three strings connected in the junction box and all three strings are then run in a single conduit um, from the junction box to the DC disconnect. What is the um, minimum wire size placed in the con, assuming the termination is unknown? So what this is saying is, okay, we come to a combine. We, we didn't come from a combiner, but we come to a junction box. So we're not combining the wires into a single larger wire. We're simply transitioning from the wire that's already connected to the PV panels to a different type of wire. And that's pretty common because that PV wire can be pretty expensive. So we're probably going to a THHN or something like that. So now we're going to be running with three sets of wire or six wires in a single conduit, well, we still have the 1.25 and the 1.25, right? So we're going to take the 9.37 times 1.25 times 1.25. But because we're in the three to six wire range, we have to further derate that by 80%. So if I take my 9.37 times 1.25 times 1.25, I get 14.64. And then I multiply or I divide that by 0.8. And I need 18 uh, amp wire. So in this case, um, we could get by with 12 gauge. I would say 10 gauge. Have I figured this out right? Or did I mess it up? Let's see if they're asking for 12 gauge. I hope it says 10 gauge. Nope, it's saying 12 gauge, but just use 10. Um, so 10 gauge wire would be a better solution, but the minimum, it says what's the minimum and it's gonna be 12 gauge. Okay, everybody clear on that? Now, if we had combined these in a combiner box rather than a junction box, well, then we'd have three strings coming in. Each string would be with the adjustment 14.64, and the combiner box now, since we're hooking them up in parallel, amps increase. So it would be three times 14.64. That's going to be 32, 34 amps, more or less, right? We don't have to derate it because there are only going to be two wires. Don't have to derate for conduit fill, but it's still going to be about 34 amps. So looking at this, 34, we're going to need eight gauge wire if it were combined, but we'd only need two eight gauge wire. We'd need six 12 gauge wire. Have I lost anybody? Okay, I think there may just be one more question. Panels, oh, combiner box. I guess that's the last question, isn't it? We need eight gauge wire. Whoops. Oh, it's it's not saying, well, wait a second. That can't be right. All right, three strings connected in a combiner box. Single string is then run to the DC disconnect. Am I still derating it there? 43, since they're unknown, we, we, ring, we read from column one, 
Oh, I see. Yeah. So we'd have six, six gauge. So maybe I read that last column wrong. Yeah. Six, six gauge wire because it's um, 50, it's uh, 44. And I think in my brain, since I was doing it mentally, I said 34. So that's where my issue was. Yeah. 44 amps. Well, 44 amps, it can't be eight gauge wire. It's got to be six gauge wire, right? So if I stop talking, I won't confuse everybody. So at this point, I messed it up. I didn't get enough. So I have to redo this quiz, which I'm not going to do right now. But that's the plan of this system is you got to get an 80% on each quiz before you advance beyond that. So you just go back and redo it. All right, we're coming to the end of our time or a little bit past. Anybody have any questions, uh, anything um, for before over the next week? Yep. Nathan, you just unmuted. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, for the hands-on practical, yeah. um, are we still on for like, was it the 26th? Uh, it depends on which class you're in, but yeah, the dates haven't changed. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I've got different people in different in different groups for the hands-on, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't have those numbers right here in front of me. I don't, oh, here. Uh, you said the 26th. Nathan, were you the one in Dayton? No. No, okay. All right. I, I'm, I'm showing. West Virginia. Okay, West Virginia. Yeah, 28th and 29th, right? That's a thursday and a friday yeah okay so yeah that's still set Hiram group is the 7th and 8th of october and marietta group 23rd and 24th so of september so okay uh nathan, any pardon i was just gonna ask nathan do we know where we're meeting for the west virginia group on the 28th 29th yeah you'll probably be in the... yeah you'll be in my classroom 205 Okay. Yep. Is okay. is is the solar stuff in your way there in your classroom? Nah, I've been working around it. It's it's okay. okay. Good. Yeah, I'm coming in a day earlier uh, up there because there's a, still a few things that need to be finished. Um, so uh, I'll probably coordinate with you as far as not being in there when you're doing class. Yeah. Um. Yeah. If you if you need an extra pair of hands moving things around, just let me know. Okay. Yeah. It's mostly just little terminations and bits. Some of the materials didn't arrive until later. So okay. pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay. All right. So we'll meet again next Tuesday. And um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, just email me and uh, we should be all set to go. All right. Take care.